So let's talk more about in vitro maturation. It's not that it's just uh, come in, the, in this year post-pandemic. It's been there for long. Then why are we talking about IVM clinical applications? I'll take you through it. First, I think apologies from Dr. Durga because she couldn't make it because of uh, an emergency at the hospital and I'm taking over her presentation. So we'll quickly, that's the outline of today's session. Uh, we're going to talk about IVM, its success rates, and the whole scenario in the Indian context of uh, ART. So what is IVM? It, it's basically you're going to take uh, the oocytes from immature follicles, from very small follicles, and then you're going to first mature them outside the body, and then you're going to do the IVF. Contrary to an IVF where you're getting the mature oocytes and then you're doing the insemination with the sperm. So there is a difference and that's what is, is IVM. And uh, so that's ideally how um, a, uh, an immature or a GV stage oocyte looks. It then becomes a metaphase one oocyte turning out to be a metaphase two, which is what is called as a mature egg. The egg needs to be a metaphase two mature egg in order to accept the sperm. And in a normal stimulated cycle, we're going to see a nice expanded cumulus complex. But that is how the immature eggs are going to see when you really pull them out from very tiny follicles. And that's where the IVM comes into the picture. So what are the advantages? You know, why should we be looking at IVM? And we're doing pretty well with IVF. Why are we even looking at IVM? So I think uh, these are a few of the advantages. I think it's going to first help us reduce or eliminate the risk of OHSs because we're hardly giving any gonadotropins in the IVM process. The side effects of the hormones are absolutely minimal because, again, we're not giving any gonadotropins or very minimal gonadotropins. Uh, you know, it's cheaper. The pain with the injections with the woman is going to get is all going to be kept at bay with IVM being in place. Uh, there's very minimal monitoring that's needed you know, the presentation just spoke about tourism, where the patient could go from Bombay to Delhi to Kerala. The monitoring is not needed, and the patient can actually happily have holiday in, uh, in India if IVM is done, because there's minimal monitoring that's needed. And, uh, of course, you know, in cases where fertility preservation is needed, where you do not have time to stimulate, or giving gonadotropins or hormones is contraindicated, IVM is uh, the answer for these cancer patients. So, you know, it's, it's 1989 is where IVM was first done, and I was fortunate to be at Monash University where Alan Trounson did the first IVM, and that's the connect I have got with Monash, and Dr. Durga was at Magdal University where uh, Professor Tan and Chian did a lot of work on IVM those days, and uh, we've been ca carrying that passion back to India, and we've been doing IVM since uh, the inception of OASIS from 2010, and uh, we now have a collaboration with Brussels University, and I'll take you through that. So success way back was very less, and now with all the newer insights and developments that have happened within vitro maturations, I think the success has now come close to 35 to 40%, probably 10 to 15% lesser than what a normal IVF XC cycle would give. But IVM is giving promising results, and thanks to the ASRM committee, which is now declared at no longer experimental. It is a routinely accepted clinical procedure that can be offered to every patient who are coming to our clinics. So, you know, in an IVM, you do not give a HCG trigger. Ideally, that's what the new insights say. In the past, even we did this truncated IVM where we give, gave patients the HCG trigger, but the newer insights, Rob Gilchrist, if you've read the papers, Professor William Ledger and Rob Gilchrist at the University of New South Wales have done so much of work where they say do not give a HCG trig uh, because that's going to cut off the signaling of cumulus cells to the cytoplasm and that's not going to help the in vitro maturation go in the right direction. So a truncated IVF and IVM, that's the difference ideally we're talking about. So quickly to take you through what a CARPA IVM, and that's what is the new thing and that's what OASIS is now collaborated with University of uh, Brussels. Professor Johan Smith is the scientist with whom I've been proudly associated and working. So what we do in uh, I, uh, this CARPA IVM or a biphasic IVM is, you know, the uh, uh, patient has, um, you know, got the pretreatment and then 
uh, gets a period, we only give them one or two shots of gonadotropins, absolutely uh, not more than that. And then we are going to plan the oocyte retrieval where the follicles, the biggest diameter is eight millimeters. So six to eight millimeters, so tiny are the follicles. So the skill of the uh, clinician to scrape the follicles and the skill of the embryologist to identify these oocytes because they're devoid of cumulus most of the times. They're absolutely tiny, and that's what uh, uh, we do. And then there is this uh, capacitation media. For 24 hours, you're exposing these immature oocytes. Then you put them to in vitro maturation media, and then you do the ICSI cycle. So that's how, that's an overview of how a CAPA IVM is uh, done. So ideally, this is the physiology, or this is what happens in the biphasic or CAPA IVM you're going to be using certain chemicals which are arresting meiosis. So going back to the cell cycle, we all know, you know, resumption of the meiosis, the first meiotic division, and that's when the first polar body is extruded, which means the egg has become mature. So we are exposing the, uh, these tiny cumulus that we are scraping to these meiotic arrests so that, you know, there's synchronization between the uh, nucleus and the cytoplasm, and that's what has helped have better success with IVM. In the past, I think the success was really less, and it wasn't encouraging. We said IVM doesn't work. But now, with the new insights from Rob Gilchrist, no HCG and exposing it to these meiotic arrest chemicals, which is amphiregulin and C natriuretic peptide. So that's a little overview of what it is. So. You, that's at retrieval, a very, very tiny cumulus. Then you're going to be exposing it to certain meiotic inhibitors which, uh, and uh, certain um, uh, growth factors. You're going to put that in the capacitation media, then into the in vitro maturation media. You're going to get mature oocytes, and then you inject the uh, uh, oocytes. So oocyte capacitation, and then going ahead with the So that's ideally what happens in the CAPA or biphasic IVM. You're going to prevent or delay meiotic resumption. You're going to preserve the oocyte cumulus gap junctions. The signaling pathway or the communication channel is left open. And that's what is enhancing uh, the whole development process here. There is synchronization between the nuclear and cytoplasmic maturity, which will eventually enable the oocyte to fertilize, become an embryo, and result in, in implantation of successful pregnancy. So that's, uh, so the uh, Brussels University initially tied up with the Vietnamese group, Professor Lan's group, and they've been doing this for the last five years, and they uh, published this data of close to 100 patients where they've done this CAPA IVM. This is the first time it, they were trying to do it on human trials at Vietnam, and they said that, you know, it all works well. The maturity was almost 63% with this new CAPA IVM where it was only 49 in the past when they were giving the HCG triggers. And uh, coming to the live birth rates, with the traditional IVM, it was close to 30%, but with the new thing, I think it's come up to 47%, 47.5 at the Vietnamese uh, uh, group. So, you know, where do you do this IVM? It's, it's primarily PC or multicystic ovaries. It's not for people with low reserves, previous uh, failed implantations and on oncofertility. So people where gonadotropins is contraindicated, there's risk of OHSs, oncofertility, and PCO is what ideally we have been trying to do this. So we collaborated with this Brussels people. Uh, you know, after the, the pandemic, our collaboration started. So we've done close to 21 patients so far. Our maturity of the oocytes has been close to 54%, and uh, fertilization of 85%. And we do a day three freeze here specifically because that's what is the protocol set by the Brussels people. And uh, we've done close to 15 FETs, a clinical pregnancy of 36%. Uh, and we finally had the historic moment at Oasis, India's first Kappa IVM live birth, which just happened uh, in, in the month of February. So we're absolutely proud. It has taken me four years to collaborate with the Brussels team to convince them that you know, we could take up this project. Finally, they let us um, collaborate. The chemicals come from them. We, uh, right now, it's, we really don't know what exactly and what concentration is going, but they shared the protocol. We've been doing this, and that's, all that hard work finally led to uh, birth of the first CAPA IVM child. 
you know, no medications, less cost, no side effects, minimal monitoring. What more are we really talking about? So I'll rush through these case scenarios. This is one of the cases that we did for the first cycle. She had very poor oocyte quality. So we, she was PCO, so we went ahead and we did um, IVM for her, where we got some 15 oocytes, 10 matured. So the first cycle, that's how the embryos looked absolutely crap. From IVM, look, I got beautiful embryos, and this lady managed to deliver a healthy child. This is another case where cerebral thrombosis, they said, absolutely, we can't stimulate this lady. You need a donor cycle. We did IVM for her, and we managed to um, help her attain uh, uh, pregnancy, and those were the embryos that uh, helped her conceive. There's another lady who was resistant to gonadotropin who went to the maximum dosage of it, but she wasn't responding a dominant follicle at all. So we finally did IVM uh, for her. And again, you know, we got blastocysts also in this case, and this lady uh, conceived. So these are the various indications where we went ahead and did that. And there were a couple of uh, onco patients where we have helped. So there was one of this lady with endometrial carcinoma. We had no time to stimulate uh, for her. So we went and we pulled up the immature um, uh, oocytes. And uh, we helped this lady. And there was another case of ductal carcinoma. So in fertility preservation patients, where there's an emergency need for egg collection, I think CARPA IVM is a wonderful alternative that we looked at. There was one of the study, again, Michael DeVos, a lot of publications on IVM from Brussels University. And he's put across this review where he's looked at the long-term follow-up. In fact, Brussels University has also done a lot of um, studies on the epigenetics of these children born from IVM, and it all seems to be safe at this point. So this was that paper which looked at close to 1,500 IVM-born children. They haven't found an, any concerning trend of uh, growing incidence of congenital anomaly. So at this point, it looks safe. So what is the take home with this IVM that we're talking, you know, with ASRM saying it's no longer experimental, the CARPA IVM, biphasic IVM being uh, quite giving us promising results. I think it's economical. I'm sure my pharma friends might not really like this because you're really not going to use a lot of gonadotropins. For the patient, this is going to be a patient pocket-friendly approach. There's going to be absolutely minimal intervention, monitoring, side effects. So patients are going to really not have a lot of hassles. They're going to enjoy that journey. The, uh, I'm sure with so many other interventions like use of uh, letros and you know, uh, volume expanders, the incidence of OHSS has come down, but IVM would probably be one way of going OHSS free in our clinics. You know, there's always been that concern that malignancy can happen in the future with so much of gonadotropins being given to the women and IVM, we're not using gonadotropin, so you're going to allay that risk of malignancy in the future. It looks safe at this point in time. Um, and, and it can be used in these cancer patients where we do not really have time to stimulate uh, the lady. So you know what? With the new law coming into the picture, you can only take seven eggs from a donor. You know, we all are very concerned with this. We really are now working on a pilot where all our donor program gets onto IVM. We do not give gonadotropins, or we give them minimal gonadotropins because we only want seven eggs. That's what the laws at this point says. IBM could be an answer. You're getting uh, uh, pregnancies close to 40%. Uh, that's going to really cut the cost and help a lot of people. So IBM in donor cycles is something that we have started to work on. Uh, very soon we're going to have the data shared with you all. Uh, minimal stimulation, no side effects, economical. That's what it is. And finally, I think a lot of PCO patients, where you're going to do at least three or four cycles of IUI, do one cycle of CARPA IVM, and I'm sure it's going to really make a huge uh, difference to the patient and also the success rates of 40%. You know, even after three consecutive cycles, I think we're kind of promising them 30% success rate with IUI. Uh, with IVM, we're taking it almost to 40% take-home baby rates. So I'm sure this is time to change our outlook, our approach, and there we are at Oasis trying to bring across state-of-art CARPA IVM uh, to the reach to every person in, in Indian fraternity. 
uh, and I'm hoping, you know, Brussels University is looking forward to extend this and do more and more work because they're very keen to see how this would work in Indian PCO women because Vietnamese has got lean PCOs and Indian PCOs are rubies, we all know that. And they really want to see what kind of demographic change it's going to make and that's the uh, change and that's, thank you so much for this opportunity, guys, today. Uh, you know, it's a moment of pride for all of us at Oasis to have the first successful Kappa IVM uh, live birth. It all looks uh, nice and encouraging, and uh, there wouldn't have been an, uh, uh, a platform better than this to share with you all this wonderful news. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think, you know, we want to bring IVM into the limelight. It was somewhere way, way far away. Even to start with, I was very skeptical that IVM would work. You know, as an embryologist, I want minimal manipulation. I want to be closer to the nature, and IVM does so much of manipulation. I wasn't very convinced, but I think seeing is believing, and now after years of working with IVM, I think we're not really manipulating too much, and the data is reassuring. Thank you so much. Thank you.